Hello and welcome to today's session through the Baldwin Professional Education Connection. Today's topic is HIPAA Complete, an introduction to the HIPAA Privacy Rule. My name is Marie Smith and I will be your moderator for today. I do wanna let you know that today's session is being recorded and we will share the slides once the recording is complete. So you will have them for future reference as well. At the end of today's session, we will have some time for a Q&A session. So feel free to type any questions as, as we go along and we will do our best to address these questions at the end of the presentation. Lastly, anyone looking to receive professional education credit through SHRM or HRCI for today's session, you will receive all the information you need to submit for these credits at the end of the session. Before we, before we go any further, I just need to share with you that the Baldwin Regulatory Compliance Collaborative is not a law firm and cannot provide legal advice. We are providing this information to you solely in our capacity as consultants with knowledge and experience in the industry, but not with legal advice. For more information on HIPAA or to review related agency guidance by the Office of Civil Rights and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, please visit the following, hhs.gov forward slash OCR and hhs.gov forward slash HIPAA for professionals. Today, I'm joined by Natasha Wright, who is the Compliance and Technology Integration Manager, and Jason Sheffield, the National Director of Compliance here at the Baldwin Regulatory Compliance Collaborative. Again, my name is Marie Smith, a National Technical Trainer for Employee Benefits, and I am your moderator for today. We do have a packed agenda. In part one, we will do a HIPAA refresher and an understanding of how to apply the privacy rule. We will then move on to part two, where we define PHI or protected health information. In part three, we will cover the principal uses and disclosures before moving on to part four, where we discuss the notice and other individual rights under HIPAA. In five, we will review HIPAA's administrative requirements. And in part six, we will re review how to perform or apply HIPAA's administrative simplification requirements. And then in seven, we have some worksheets for you. Lastly, we will close with a question and answer session. So if you do have any questions, please type them in the questions box and we will do our best to cover them at the end of the presentation. And without further ado, here is Jason Sheffield to review the learning objectives. Hi everyone, I'm glad to join you today. So we've got uh, six different learning objectives for the program today. And these are important because uh, this, this first piece of HIPAA, the privacy rule, covers a really wide spectrum of concepts and requirements. So number one, we want to understand and apply the definition of protected health information, or PHI, to various types of medical records and other related information. Now you'll notice here we're only talking about PHI, protected health information. The other term or acronym you've probably seen a lot is E hyphen PHI, and that stands for electronic PHI. That's really relegated over to the lines of the security rule under HIPAA, which is going to be in our next presentation. So the next HIPAA program that we present will cover the security rule. Here today, we're only going to talk about PHI. Two, distinguish between employer-related data uh, and information and protected health data and information. So here you're going to learn to distinguish between what's an employer file or record and what is a uh, PHI file or record under HIPAA. For three, learn the various types of non-disclosure exceptions provided for under the privacy rule, including general, categorical, and enhanced exceptions. For four, understand and apply basic principles of the business associate relationship for plan sponsors bound by HIPAA's privacy rule. Remember, under HIPAA, there is an entire regulatory process for how you allocate your liabilities and responsibilities under HIPAA, uh, respecting the privacy of, the privacy of protected health information, to business associates, all of those other entities that you work with to create your employee benefits web of operations. Under five, we want to understand and apply basic principles you know, the requirements related to individual, secretary, and media breach notifications arising from potential and or improper breaches of PHI. Now, when we get into breach notification, we'll actually, our third program in the HIPAA series specifically covers the um, breach notification rule, and we go into a lot of detail there, so there's just a highlight in this program, but I wanted to give you an introduction here. Uh, six, understand and apply the basic administrative simplification framework provided for under HIPAA privacy and security rules. So the administrative simplification framework is the is a set of concepts and requirements uh, by which an employer comes into preliminary or advanced compliance with HIPAA privacy requirements. What that means is that it used to be prior to the 20 uh, prior to the omnibus rule that came out, 
you you only could really be um, investigated or looked at for a breach of HIPAA if you had a if you had harms that arose from breach activity. So participants actually had to be harmed by a breach. However, after the new omnibus, omnibus rule came out, you could actually be investigated and audited and fined or penalized for having not completed those preliminary administrative or preliminary and ongoing administrative simplification requirements, even if you don't have a breach. And what that said to the community is it was an indication that OCR was going to be able to start doing random audits. They don't actually have to wait for a breach now. They can come after you if you've not complied with the administrative requirements of HIPAA. So we're going to go through those administrative requirements and spend a good bit of time on those today, uh, just advising you what they are and how they operate, because you have to have performed those if you're ever audited, regardless of whether you had a breach. All right, so I'm going to pass it off to Natasha, who's going to do some substantive education on the privacy rule. Natasha? Thank you, Thank you, Jason. Now let's take a moment and let's review the HIPAA rule and understand how to apply the privacy rule. There are basically four major purposes of HIPAA. Um, first is to provide protection of protected health information, otherwise known as PHI. Under HIPAA, an employer with a self-funded medical plan will not release information to anyone outside of the plan other than the employee without the employee's permission, unless otherwise permitted by the HIPAA law. A second purpose of the rule is to limit employment discrimination. The employer of the self-funded plan cannot use any information about the employee related to the medical plan to make employment-related decisions about the employee or that will affect the employee. The HIPAA rule also requires a system of checks and balances to monitor who has or had access to PHI. The rule requires the employer to maintain a detailed paper trail of this. And the last purpose of the rule is um, properly documenting the insurance carriers, TPAs, vendors, and other third-party service advisors that they are adhering to the requirements of the HIPAA rule. Um, HIPAA rule has also four major components. Let's start by looking at the HIPAA privacy rule. I like to break the privacy rule down in five sections. The privacy rule requires the covered entities to put in place and maintain adequate safeguards to protect the PHI. It then outlines the non-disclosure exceptions to the rule for general and individual use. The rule sets forth individual rights of inspection, duplication, and correction of uh, record errors. The privacy rule also defines what a business associate is and what agreements need to be in writing. The last uh, part of the privacy rule outlines requirements of the brief notification rule, which we'll briefly go over, but in our next session, we'll go over in more detail. This is including notices to individuals, health and human services, and when needed, the media. Let's review the HIPAA security rule. The HIPAA security rule is going to outline the rules for electronic form of PHI, or what is known as ePHI. It outlines rules related to creation, receipt, maintenance, and the transfer of electric PHI. An example of that is, is if I were needing to email something to a carrier from one from, a, from my own individual place of employment or from a TPA, and it was going out electronically, being faxed or being emailed, and it contained information that was considered PHI. Let's take a look at the enforcement rule. The HIPAA enforcement rule defines compliance responsibilities for the covered entities. It outlines the details um, of the scope of agencies' investigations and how they are going to be conducted. The enforcement rule also outlines civil monetary structure for penalties. And it's going to outline the administra administrative procedures of hearings and appeals. In case of a breach in PHI, the breach notification rule is going to explain the obligations for individual notices in respect to the scope, responsibility, harm, and steps that were taken to remedy, remedy uh, the breach event. The notification outlines the filings required to HHS and breaches affecting 500 or more will require media uh, notifications. The covered entity is also required to provide HHS an annual notice in respect to smaller breaches of unsecured PHI 
or electric PHI. And the covered entity must archive the records of the breach and the breach correction for a minimum of six years. Let's take a look at just understanding the privacy rule and how it works. So in understanding the privacy rule and how to apply it, we must have to understand that the rule is designed to be balanced and it's also made to be flexible. It's gonna cover a variety of uses and disclosures, but the goal of the rule is twofold, is to protect individual health information while simultaneously allowing for the flow of information needed for individuals to receive high quality health care. So who must comply with this? <clears throat> Covered healthcare providers must provide. They're providers of medical or other healthcare services, um, and they are suppliers who transmit any health information um, electronically um, in connection with any transaction, which HHH has given a standard for. Health plans, of course, individual or group health plans that provide or pay the cost for health care. So this is going to be your health insurance issuer, the carrier, Medicare, or even Medicaid programs. Also, health care clearing houses are entities that standardize health information. An example would be a billing company that processes data from its initial format to a standardized billing format. Next slide, please. Also, business associates needs to comply. This is gonna be any person or organization other than the covered entity's workforce that performs functions or activities on their behalf. This is gonna be your third party administrators. This is gonna be um, brokers, consultants, um, anyone else that's doing work for you can be considered a business associate. This is gonna be subcontractors of those business associations, right? And this might be other Another member that's not part of the um, direct workforce of the business associate, but they're still performing um, functions for the business associate on your behalf. And then Medicare prescription drug card sponsors, which is a non-governmental entity that offers an, an endorsed discount drug program under the Medicare Modernization Act. They also need to make sure that they're complying to the rule. When working in a business associates relationship, cover entities are required to include specific protections in the business agreement. The cover entity must impose written safeguards on the individually identifiable, I'm sorry, identifiable health information used or disclosed by its business associates. As a cover entity may not contractually authorizes business associates to make any use or disclosure of protected health information that will violate that rule. Every requirement that you give for the business associate also has to apply to those contractors of the business associate. Let's define exactly what protected health information is and what PHI is not. The privacy rule is going to protect all individually identifiable health information held or transmitted by the covered entity or a business associate. This is going to be if it's of uh, any form, electronic, paper, oral, or phone call, as long as that information is considered protected health information. Okay. PHI is going to be information, including demographic data, that's going to relate to a condition. So in an individual's past, present, or even in the future, anything that's a condition, a health condition, physical or mental, if it has information about the care to that individual. And also if it's in the past, if it's current or future, any payment information when it is connected to that individual's health care. So before you, you're going to see an equation, and it's called the PHI equation. And really, whenever you're looking at information, 
if you ask these three questions, it's gonna help you understand if what you're looking at or what you're handling is actually PHI. First is, does it include identifying information? This is gonna be full name or last name and the first name initial, geographical identifiers, DO birth, date of birth and treatment dates, just to name a few. And then think about, has this information been created into a document, into an email, uh, where it can be accessed or sent. Is there information there that is related to the individual's past, present, and future health condition? Any healthcare service that's been rendered to the individual or any payment for health services? Hey, Natasha, do you mind if I had a comment there? Absolutely. Okay, um, so one thing I just wanted to note for everyone that's uh, joining us today, in part one of that equation where it says identifying information, keep in mind, that this comes up a lot, or, or the analysis of this component comes up a lot, can be really complicated when dealing with a self-funded employer health plan. And the reason for that is that oftentimes the CFO or other members of the executive committee may get access to PHI because the plan is self-funded and they have to re review utilization and claims data. Now, when that happens, um, in a small organization particularly, so you're talking 250 employees or fewer, uh, what can happen sometimes is that even where the person that the claim information relates to is not identified by name or social security number, in an organization that's small, based on the condition, the underlying health condition of that individual, there may be an inference made there who that's about. And if an inference is made and some kind of inappropriate conduct takes place against that individual based on that inference, then that becomes identifying information, even though that person is not identified by name or their social or whatever. So for example, if you had someone that say had uh, a premature child, childbirth and, it, and there were a lot of complications and it came up to like a $850,000 claim and that employee was then subsequently punished for being late four times in a row or something like that and no other employees were, that could be identifying information because there could be a reasonable inference drawn that that individual uh, was identified through that claims information based on the fact that that condition was not existing with other, any other employees that were covered under the medical plan. So just a thought I wanted to add there because it's that comes up a lot with small employees. Thanks, Natasha. Thank you, Jason. So let's talk about distinguishing PHI from employment-related data. Okay. So here we have examples of what protected health information is, a doctor's letter of explanation or an EOB. It can be an email or telephone conference between the plan representative and the employee or you at your place of the cover entity. Um, what is employment related information? Let's say you have FMLA paperwork, unemployment paperwork, or even work compensation, um, drug testing results related and other related information related to the job, or even a return to work certification. And there, there may be other rules and regulations that does protect the information that's employment related. That information is not what's considered P, uh, protected health information under the HIPAA rule. So there are no restrictions on the use or disclosure of de-identified health information. Um, de-identified de health information, um, it doesn't identify or provide a reasonable basis to identify the individual. And there are two ways that you can de-identify information. You either can have a formal determination by a qualified statistician or the removal of specified identifiers of the individual and of the individual's relatives, household members, and employers. But remember that only if the covered entity has no actual knowledge that the remaining information could be used to identify the individual, can you use that, that the identification um, of the information, okay? So we're not going to go over in detail today, but now on the next slide, we're going to show several examples of identifiers. And once these things have been completely removed from the information, then there's when it becomes no restrictions on it and the use of it in this disclosure. As you can see before you, it's very common information, such as the name of the individual, geographic information, such as their social security number, zip codes, addresses, telephone numbers, email addresses, anything that could identify that person and link that information to that person has to be removed.
Okay, in the next few slides, we're gonna talk about the principles of uses and disclosures within the rule. Okay, so a basic principle of the rule is that a major purpose of the privacy rule is to define and limit the circumstances in which individuals PHI can be used or disclosed by the covered entity. Okay, remember which we talked about earlier that it's a balance, right? Um, as the privacy permits, then you can use the information or as the individual who is the subject of the information authorizes in writing. Required disclosures are a covered entity must disclose PHI in only two situations. The individuals um, that the information is about, um, they request access to or an accounting of their PHI. And also to HHS when it is undertaking an, an investigation or review um, or an enforcement action. There are some voluntary disclosure exceptions. A covered entity is permitted, but is not required to use and disclose PHI information without an individual's authorization for um, purposes such as um, to the requesting individual with authority. Uh, treatment and payment and healthcare operations. Public interest and benefit activities. Limited data sets for research an informal consent with the opportunity to agree or object. I want to note here that covered entities really have to rely on their judgment and best judgment and their ethics when they're deciding which of these things are permissive uses and disclosures to make. I like to think of um, why is it required, um, what are the possible repercussions, um, and is it really needed and is it important? Next slide, please. Let's talk about authorized uses and disclosures. A covered entity must obtain an individual's written authorization if they're gonna use or disclose any PHI that is not for treatment, payment, or healthcare operations or otherwise permitted or required by the privacy rule. A covered entity may not condition treatment, payment, enrollment, or benefits eligibility on an individual granting an authorization. And when an authorization is written, it has to be written in specific terms. It cannot be general, it has to be specific. It may allow uses and disclosures of PHI by the covered entity seeking the authorization or by the designated third party. Not only does it have to be in very specific terms, Remember that it must be in plain language. It must contain important information such as what is the information that's going to be disclosed and used? Who is it being disclosed to? And who is going to be receiving this information? When does the authorization expire? And also it has to list in wording the right to revoke the authorization. Let's talk about and make sure we understand the minimum required standard. With this, the cover entity must make reasonable efforts to use, disclose, and request only the minimum amount of PHI that's needed to accomplish the intended purpose or task of that use, disclosure, or that request. The cover entity, when they're developing their processes and procedures, those processes and procedures need to contain um, reasonable limits to uses and disclosures and to the minimum necessary. So for an example, if, you, if there is a request for information for something directly, you would not send over someone's entire file. Only the information that's being requested and that's needed for that request or that use would need to be released. When the minimum necessary standard applies to a use or a disclosure, a cover entity may not use, disclose, or request that entire medical record anytime unless it's justified. So it's going to be in writing if they needed that whole record. Okay, let's, so let's talk about uses and make sure we understand that. Uses are going to always refer to the utilization within the plan 
and with certain vendors. Okay, uses is actually the most common violation under the privacy rule. Disclosures is going to be referring to when you're utilizing information outside of the plan. And whereas the use has are the most common violation, disclosure violations are the most expensive to repair due to the scope of correction required. Because usually disclosures is re releasing information um, to a wider audience and it's outside of um, the plan. So therefore, you're having to reach a lot of other people to clean up the information. Let's take a look at what uh, examples of uses. Um, emailing enrollment form to a TPA. Transmitting utilization reports to a TPA. You could be performing a claims review or a similar internal audit. You could be sharing PHI with the internal payroll department. Earlier in the discussion, Jason brought up how once you're self-funded, you have access. So maybe for some reason you guys are discussing claim information um, to plan for the following year. And therefore you're taking a look at internally the information um, from claims and, and the usage of the plan. Example of disclosures, and remember disclosures is when you're utilizing it outside the, of the plan, is transmitting records to a provider, a medical provider. There's been a request and you're emailing records to a spouse. Um, you've had a request or an authorization from an attorney or an accountant for information and you're mailing that information to them. Or transmitting any records to a union representative. In the next section, we're going to discuss notice and other individual rights under the privacy rule. Under the privacy rule, the covered entity has to provide a notice of its privacy practices. The notice must describe in ways in which this, the covered entity must, may use and disclose PHI. It also has to state and discuss the covered entity's duties to protect the privacy providing notice of privacy practices and abide by the terms of the current notice. The notice is gonna describe the individual's rights, including that the individual has the right to reach out to HHS for complaints, and also to the covered entity if they believe their privacy rights have been violated in any way. The notice also has to outline the point of contact for further information and who the individuals need to make complaints to if they're making a complaint to the cover entity. The rule also is going to have details on how to distribute the notices. Next slide, please. The cover entity or the health plan must distribute its privacy practice notice to each of its um, enrollees by its privacy rule compliance date. Thereafter, the health plan must give its notice to each new enrollee at the time of enrollment. And it often must send a reminder to every enrollee at least every three years, advising them that the notice of privacy practices is available if they need and if they request it. The health plan does satisfy the obligations of distributing the notice if they're furnishing it to the named insured So if you're giving it to the employee, that's going to satisfy the obligation respecting spouse's independence. Next slide, please. So the privacy rule assures three, assures three specific rights to all individuals with respect to their own PHI or that of their dependent. First is always going to assure the right of access, the right of amendment, and the right of an accounting of disclosures. At times, the cover entity is going to have to respond to requests. Okay. So, so there could be requests for restrictions. There could be an associate requesting PHI be protected from all non-essential personnel, including an organization's executive suite or, or the leadership. This may be because that person feels that if their information is released, um, you know, maybe there'll be possible discrimination. 
Um, it's a small location. Um, it could be several reasons, but these requests should be made in writing. It has to go directly to the privacy officer. And any denials have to be in writing. The associate can also request disclosure protections from a spouse or a dependent, typically due to a pending divorce or other litigation. I like to give an example because I've seen this come up quite often where an associate has requested this disclosure protections um, from a spouse. Um, it was in writing, it was on file, and it was directed to the privacy officer. There was no denial for this. There was no reason to deny it. To deny it. Um, and then um, there was information that was released in regards to their, their benefit plan. Um, and it later caused the lawsuit. So this is very important. I agree with Natasha on that. Just one comment here. Uh, for both of these, remember, these are requests for enhanced privacy protection. So the way the privacy rule explains the request for restrictions and the request for confidential communications is in terms of actually a voluntary exercise. You're doing. You don't have to comply with these two uh, requests for enhanced privacy protections. But to Natasha's point, um, just to kind of expand on that, you have to tell the participant or the requesting individual in writing if you cannot comply with the request. So you don't have to do it, but if you can't for some reason, you have to explain to them in writing within 30 days why you can't do it. Uh, and to Natasha's point, I mean, this is, has oftentimes it will shift um, litigation or a divorce pendency or something like that because if you release the information and the, and the associate or the participant has requested that you're not, that can affect the outcome of these cases dramatically. A lot of times this has to do with a retirement plan uh, that's got that's paying and shifting money around uh, with the health plan. You've got all these issues related to claims and where people are receiving treatment and services. Um, for example, under the confidential communications, we saw a case where uh, a, a spouse was in a treatment facility uh, because she had, was a victim of domestic abuse. And she was hiding there. She's also receiving treatment. I mean, she was living and receiving treatment there. The EOBs that she was receiving from the insurance carrier had the had her home address listed as the treatment center where she was receiving care and support as well. So the spouse that she was um, estranged from got the EOBs in the mail and was able to go and find her and harm her at the treatment center because he got her address from the EOB. She had requested in writing that the health plan not release the EOBs to her house and they sent them to her a place of employment instead. They never agreed, they never said in writing that they could not do it, so the inference at law was that they could, and she um, kind of, you know, put her faith in that, and then they did not adjust it, and they sent the EOB to her home address instead of doing what she asked for. So in that case, what they should have done is told her within writing that she needed to contact the carrier, not the employer, to redirect the delivery of the EOB. But they did not tell her that, and they did not comply with the request, and she was subsequently harmed. So that one's really serious, so just be careful with both of these. Thank you, Jason. Let's take some time now to um, look at HIPAA's administrative requirements. So when looking at HIPAA's administrative requirements, we must remember first that the covered entity must develop and implement written privacy policies and procedures that are consistent with the privacy rules. These are gonna be the policies and procedures that are gonna govern your, your program. Then the cover entity must designate a privacy official responsible for developing and implementing, implementing its privacy policies and procedures. And also the contact person or contact officer that's going to be responsible for receiving any complaint and also providing individuals inform with information in regards to what the cover entity's practices and policies are. Your workforce is also going to need to have training and management. And workforce members are going to include your employees, volunteers, training, trainees, um, and any person who is under the, the cover entity, whether they may not be paid by the entity, but they might have contact with PHI. The cover entity is going to train all the workforce members on its privacy policies and procedures as necessary and what's appropriate based on um, the information they're going to have access to so that they can carry out their professional functions. 
The cover entity must also make sure that they um, have it in their privacy policy and procedures, the appropriate sanctions against those members who violate its privacy policies and procedures of the privacy rule, and also show that they're also um, holding those individuals accountable. A cover entity's responsibility is to mitigate to the extent that is practicable. Any harmful effect it learns was caused by use or disclosure of PHI by its workforce or its business association. That's in violation of the privacy policy and procedures of the privacy rule, right? So once they find out there is there has possibly been a breach because of a, a, a um, uh, incorrect use or disclosure, they have to make sure they do everything they can to make sure there's no harm to the individuals whose information was released, and they also may have to document what they did. A covered MC must maintain um, appropriate administrative, technical, and physical safeguards to prevent any um, intentional or unintentional use or disclosure of PHI in violation of the privacy rule. And they have to put things in place to limit incidental use and disclosure. What you need to think of is them having safeguards in place for individuals who may have access to information through email, fax, um, ensuring that um, if you have information where it's housed, that is secure. If you're going to have information, uh, phone calls and you're releasing and discussing information, that you have it where individuals who have not been trained or should not have access cannot hear those phone calls. The cover entity also needs to make sure that they have procedures for individuals to complain about its compliance with this privacy policies and procedures in the privacy rule. Those procedures need to be explained in detail in the privacy practices notice. And then the cover entity needs to make sure that it's in their notice and everyone knows who they need to go to if they have a complaint within the organization and also advise that complaints can also be submitted to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Cover entities cannot retaliate against a person for exercising their rights provided by the privacy rule. If an individual is assisting in an investigation by HHS or any other authority, the cover entity cannot retaliate. The cover entity cannot require in writing or in other way for an individual to waive any right under the privacy rule as a contingent of obtaining treatment, payment, or enrollment in benefits. And then the last thing that the, the, the rule requires is documentation and record retention. A cover entity has to maintain until six years after the late, later of the date of their creation or last effective date, its privacy rules, I'm sorry, its privacy policies, its privacy procedures, notices, any complaints, any actions, any breaches, what you've done under those breaches um, to correct them, and designations that have been made need to all be documented and kept for six years. Okay. okay. Um, I just changed it again. So I'm going to take back over here on part six, talking about performance of the HIPAA administrative simplification requirements. So the administrative simplification requirements are those eight things that Natasha just went through at the end of that section. Um, those are the pieces you have to perform if you have a self-funded health, dental, or vision plan. That's what you have to do on a preemptive basis prior to having any breach or any other event happen under HIPAA. So you yeah, need a cadence for this. You need to understand there's kind of a HIPAA is an ongoing process. It's not a check the box, one and done kind of thing. It's an organic process. It grows as your organization grows, as you change your uh, employees, as you change the demographics and you become larger or smaller and you have operations in different places, in different HR centers, as you have uh, complexities change with your hardware and your software environment, and you implement new solutions. All of these things affect your HIPAA environment. So what I hate to see and what we we really do everything we can to avoid is that situation where a plan sponsor goes through this whole process, they adopt their policies and procedures, they sign them, they adopt them, they send them out, and they put them in a binder on the shelf and they don't ever touch them again. Because what happens is the very first thing that, that, that OCR does when they come in and they look at a breach or they look at an audit is they ask for your policies and procedures and they see the date upon which they were adopted and when were they last updated. And right there, they know how many substantive updates to the law have you missed and to the regulations. You missed 
based on the date that you signed them. So we, we look to update those on an annual or semi-annual basis, depending on changes in the law or the environment of the employer's shop. There's basically six steps here to administrative, administrative simplification. So this takes everything Natasha has talked about and puts it into a little um, a process here. So the first one is you appoint your officer. So you need a privacy and a security officer. Privacy officer is usually in HR and has administrative responsibilities over the plan. The security officer is generally in the information technology department and has uh, responsibilities respecting the distribution, maintenance, the care, um, the, you know, the uh, cataloging and, and archiving of PHI from an electric or electronic stand technology standpoint. Those two people will work together to draft and adopt the policies and procedures governing PHI within and without the administration, the organization. Then they will identify designated individuals. These are all the people within the organization that will have access to PHI owned by the plan as a consequence of their job-related employment duties. So they're going to work together to identify all throughout the organization everyone that will have access to the PHI. Then they're going to train those individuals. So in order to do that, guess what? The officers have to be trained themselves as well. So you're going to have training for the officers, all of those designated individuals. Then you're going to do what's called a risk assessment. You're going to look at the entire operational environment of PHI within the organization, the devices that you use, the uh, different types of safeguards that you have throughout your organization, everything from which way you turn your monitors in your offices to whether or not you use shared printers and other network devices. So you're going to do this risk assessment. You're going to do all these observations around your organization related to HIPAA compliance and the potential for breach activity. And then you're going to go into risk management, the final phase, which is where you're going to take all those observations that you conducted in risk assessment and based on your training and the policies and procedures you adopted, you're going to do risk management, which is the actions phase of making substantive changes. We're validating the current state of your HIPAA preparedness activities. So you'll actually make changes or you'll say, okay, we're in good shape with this one, with this aspect, let's move on to the other. There are safeguards that are designed by OCR under the rules that guide you through this process. Uh, there are many of them. We're gonna cover those in the security retreat. All right, next slide, please. All right, so we come up with this methodology here to help you get in, in, in scope and in compliance with HIPAA. There's a lot of stuff here. I know this is technical and it's substantive and it's, and it's pretty complicated particularly if you go from the rules and the regulations. So what we've done is consolidated this whole process and this cadence into four categories of performance or activities. You've got adoptions, assessments, appointments, and audit. So the four A's. Now, if you look here, these are just samples of the different activities that take place in these. Under adoptions, you would adopt your policies and procedures. You would adopt business associate agreement contracts with your business associates. You would draft your template participant forms for like an authorization, or an inadvertent disclosure, you would draft your ERISA documents. So remember, these are all governed by ERISA as well. So once you have your policies and procedures in place, you have to draft and adopt uh, documents that will make those effective with respect to your ERISA plans. So you'll have like a action of the board of directors, a plan amendment, and some other forms like that. Under assessments, this is training for your officers, training for designated individuals, and identification of privacy contacts. Throughout your policies and procedures, you have to identify who an individual can contact within the organization for, for more information. Appointments, you have your privacy officers, your security officer, your designated individuals, and your privacy contacts. So those are the four types of appointments you need. Auditing, you've got your risk assessment. Remember, that's the observations phase, risk management, the actions phase. You have a post-breach risk analysis of at least four factors that you have to conduct in writing whenever you have a breach. And then you have some self-help options we'll talk about in a little more, in a little more detail. Next slide, please. All right, steps one. Now, there's four steps, four steps here, four kind of processes you can go through. And what we've done is for a motivated employer, so that's an employer that's engaged in the process and is participating with their broker or consultant or advisor, these little gray bubbles to the left and in the middle here tell you about how long each phase is going to take you. Step one takes about a week, and it requires the appointment of the privacy and security officers, as well as identification of the privacy contacts. So here you're going to identify the privacy and security officer generally by name. You can also do it by title. If you're going to put it in your documents, a lot of times employers like to use title because they don't have to amend it every time the individual is replaced or retires or whatever. Um, now identify officers prior to commencement of additional compliance activities. So you've got to start with your, your officers very first because they're going to be the ones that are going to adopt and officiate all of these other requirements. Step two, 10 weeks approximately. And this is where you're drafting and adopting your policies and procedures. This is the longest piece of it. 
because there's a lot of back and forth between the employer, their consultant or advisor, and sometimes the carriers and the TPAs. You get all the right information in there. Um, there are a lot of templates out there for policies and procedures. We recommend that you work with a consultant or an expert or an attorney to put these together rather than pulling some canned ones off the internet. They're not updated frequently, and a lot of times they're not updated with current law and regulation. Next slide, please. Step three is um, identification, designation, and training for your workforce. This is where you're going to identify your designated individuals throughout your organization. You're going to appoint them. You're going to train them on the policies and the procedures and the requirements of HIPAA and make sure that they're ready to perform their job-related duties as they affect PHI. It takes about a week. Step four, three more weeks here. This is your training requirements referred to as assessments. So here you've got to train your officers privacy and security officers, that training is in depth. It takes time. A lot of times it's not bifurcated when you go to vendors. So be careful. The officer training covers all of the HIPAA rules, not just privacy and security. So it's got to cover notification and um, enforcement as well. Designated individuals get overviews. This is generally limited to the privacy and security rules. Um, most all officers and designated individuals need to be trained within 90 days of their post. And then a refresher training at least once every 24 months thereafter. All right, next slide. These are the last two steps, five and six. Five takes about four weeks, and this is where you perform your privacy and security risk assessment. So you go in there, remember you do all your observations regarding your operational environment. Um, I would say four weeks. You can do this in two weeks if you're motivated, depending on the complexity of your organization. Uh, this is gonna be the privacy and security officer work together to coordinate this. It's gotta be written, so you've got to actually do this in writing. Distinguish this from a HIPAA gap analysis that's conducted by an employer, and that's when you have an identified gap in your management process. That's just separate report. Um, step six takes about two weeks, and this is risk management process. That's, the, that's where you're actually going in. You do a security risk analysis through an HHS online tool. It gives you a report, uh, tells you any changes you need to make based on the observations you can put. And then once you have that report, you're audit ready. So that is the finalization and the completion of the administrative system tasks for an employer. Next slide. All right, so finally here, we've got some administrative simplification worksheets. These will guide you through conducting those activities. We're not going through them now. I just wanted them in here for your use. So you can go to the next slide, Murray. You'll see how these are set up. It's got the requirement on the left, uh, the description. So it just tells you a little bit of what, about what you have to do if you want more information. There is a citation from the Code of, Code of Federal Regulations there. So you can Search those on Google or on your um, legal internet service and research service, and you can find more information about these. And then you just have a status box to just mark off if you conducted each of those activities and by whom. Next slide. There's the rest of your requirements. There are 13 of them, and they have subparts. And so this brings us to part seven of our question, as a party, our question and answer session here. All right. So I'll pass it back to Marie to do a little Q&A. Okay, thank you, Jason. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, first question is, how long do I have to implement HIPAA before I am at risk of enforcement and penalties? That's a Good great question. question. Oh, thanks. Yes, of course. Um, so typically, <clears throat> and these need to be into, your uh, plan needs to be implemented at the last day of 2013 or upon adoption of the plan. A lot of times I also get the question, well, I wasn't self-insured, um, I didn't have access to information, so now what is the timing? And what we found is that generally, if you're actively working toward compliance and putting policies and procedures in place, you're typically fine. Jason, do you have anything to add to that? No, I would just say like to be careful around that, make sure that you're actively engaged in performance of those administrative simplification requirements if you haven't done it yet. Uh, unless your plan was adopted and made formal as of today, all of this is supposed to be done already. So you want to be you want to be actively engaging the process. HIPAA compliance is really an evolution for an employer, just like it's an evolution for the agencies. When these uh, requirements originally became effective, you know, over a decade ago, there were very there were very little guidance from the uh, agencies on how to actually implement all this stuff. So it's kind of an evolving process on both sides. The most important kind of concept or rule here is just remember. If you've not prepared or completed all of these administrative simplification requirements as of today, you're already self-funded, 
get to work on it. As long as you've started and engaged the process, and you are subsequently audited for breach or a random audit, you're going to be okay as long as you are working on this and you are moving toward voluntary compliance. Great, great response. Thank you. Um, second question is HIPAA just about health information? What about non medical PHI or confidential information like at the state level? Oh, okay. Um, Natasha, is that good if I take this one? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so um, I think what we're going with, where we're going with this question is if it's not, if it's excluded under the HIPAA rules, for, for example, when Natasha was talking about like drug testing results for employment records. So employment records are things that are related to the employment relationship and not the provision of healthcare are not PHI records. That's not PHI, that is, but it's likely confidential information like drug testing results have a lot of very confidential information. If you've ever looked at a drug test result, it's got the participant's name, the, the employee's name, it's got their address a lot of times, their social security number or their employee ID, and it's got all kinds of medical information about their blood type, their urinalysis, all these pieces, right? So there's a lot of highly sensitive classified or confidential information there, but it's not covered by the HIPAA privacy rules and requirements. So then what, what administrator or what governs the, the kind of safeguarding of that information after the employer takes it from the employee or accepts it? Well, there are state laws in almost every state at this point that govern the administration of confidential employment related information. So even though you don't have to comply with HIPAA, you're going to have to comply with your state laws. Um, there are also other um, international laws and other um, jurisdictional laws outside of the United States that govern the administration of information that come into play if you put anything on the internet, um, because those you can access the internet in Europe just like you can from the United States. So there's lots of layers of law and regulation here over privacy and security. We're only focusing on HIPAA and probably we'll have a supplemental program later on down the road that will talk about some of the other privacy and um, security considerations at the state and international levels. Does that work, Maureen? Yeah, that's great. I feel like we could we could spend hours and hours talking about non-HIPAA privacy related topics. Absolutely. Um, looks like there's another question here. Are other types of insurance covered under HIPAA, um, like ST, long-term disability, short-term disability, and work comp, for example? Let's start off with what is HIPAA uh, covered by HIPAA and what is uh, HIPAA provide for protections. That's going to be health insurance companies and their health plans, HMOs, and really what we're focusing big on with this presentation is employer-sponsored health plans um, and employer-sponsored dental and vision plans. Um, government programs would also be covered under that. So no, when you look at long-term disability, short-term disability, even life insurance or supplemental disability, accident and critical illnesses, those type of coverages are going to be exempt um, under HIPAA. Okay, thank you. Did I answer that? You're welcome. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Um, all right. So um, to wrap things up here, um, we answered any questions that we have time for. Um, any other questions that came in, uh, we will do our best to address those questions separately and send them out after the presentation. Uh, for your information showing on your screen here is the National uh, Compliance Team at the Baldwin Regulatory Compliance Collaborative. Um, and if you have any questions or comments about today's presentation, feel free to reach out to Nicole or Jason. And thank you and have a great rest of your day.